Good morning. I am Samir Mehta and welcome to cccliveCases.org. This is the fourth session we are having this morning and uh, I am particularly happy to welcome all the interventional cardiology fellows who have uh, now made this a part of their uh, CATH conference. Uh, I've also received uh, several questions from you uh, asking mainly whether this can become a formal CME event. That should be happening fairly soon. In the sessions before, you've seen uh, the left ventricular assist devices, uh, bifurcating distal left main, trifurcating lesions. We have another extremely exciting uh, case for you today. Uh, I'm going to switch you in a moment to Dr. Sharma in the cath lab, uh, which is all ready and uh, uh, set to show you this very exciting case. Uh, emphasis today is going to be all on techniques. Uh, it's a fascinating rotablator case, but uh, uh, clearly there is going to be, you'll see the hand movements, the wire handling, the guiding catheters, and all the fine movements. Uh, so with that introduction, Samir, uh, good morning. Uh, you're ready to go, I see. Yes, uh, good morning, uh, Samir, and uh, to all our, uh, all of our uh, registrants uh, for our fourth uh, month uh, fourth case now for a uh, live uh, webcast uh, with my uh, team here uh, in the cath lab uh, left side uh, Dr. Keeney and right are my fellows uh, Sweta and Jason. So we'll uh, start and of course we'll introduce with the rest of my cath lab staff as we go along. The theme today as you mentioned will be on the technique of rotational atherectomy and this is one of the device which I'm very much attached to and uh, there have been a lot of uh, uh, request to us to show various technical steps so that we will uh, go through with this particular case. Now, this patient is a 78-year-old male, has exertional angina for last two months. He had a primary PCI of proximal circumflex as a part of inferior STEMI in June of er early this year, and that time had a bare metal stent in the proximal circ, and he n was known to have distal circumflex and the LAD disease. The risk factors of high blood pressure, hyperlipidemia, diabetes, and uh, serum creatinine is 1.4 with a peripheral vascular disease and prior MI. He has been on good medical therapy, and we actually have tested him when he came last time on clopidogrel that he has an inhibition of 52%, because now knowing that we have a choice of an agent, if the clopidogrel not working, you can switch them to presagrel so that routinely those who are already on clopidogrel and needs a multi-vessel uh, intervention and complex intervention on diabetic, we are routinely testing them on, on with your acumetrics device to see platelet inhibition. If platelet inhibition is more than 30%, we continue clopidogrel, but if it is less than 30%, then we switch to presagrel, giving 60 milligram load and then 10 milligram daily. Uh, although this patient will be at border because his age is also 78, the one which has shown slight higher bleeding in a Timmy uh, 38 trial. Uh, and basically, his coronary point of view, he has two vessel disease with EF of 50 uh, percent, 50 and 55 percent. And uh, disease-wise, he has osteal LAD and LAD diagonal bifurcation, which I'll show you. And he had a circumflex disease with a patent proximal circ and distal circumflex lesions. Uh, at that time, uh, we just uh, quickly go through his NGO. Uh, actually, LV has completely recovered now. After our last intervention of the circumflex, LV has completely recovered. Anybody comes for a stage intervention, we go back to check our coronary anatomy, and if there was LV dysfunction to begin with, we always try to see how much LV has recovered. This is the right coronary artery, which is fine, and this is the circumflex. Uh, you can see the bare metal stent in the proximal circ. There is a diffuse disease of that OM, and we did a LPL and distal circ, uh, PTCA and uh, drug looting stent. The large stent in the distal circumflex, which is the PL, have a PTCA, followed by kissing balloon dilatation. So that this has been done earlier this month, and we brought him here today for purpose of, actually you can appreciate here, at 12 o'clock position, a lot of calcium, more so in the diagonal, at 12, 1 o'clock position, and this is the LED diagonal bifurcation. This is our question. As you can see, is the Duke type D, that uh, the, the lesion in the may parent <coughs> vessel before the bifurcation, after the bifurcation, and in the side branch. As you know, that osteal branches usually have a minor blockage. In this case, a little longer and more important is a quite calcific. Uh, I hope uh, it is pro 
projecting out. So that, that will be our goal today to take care of this legion. Having said that, I wanted to start uh, today's our webcast with uh, some educational uh, input and teaching about rotational atherectomy. Now, as we know, the rotational atherectomy is the, our diamond microchip, which works by phenomena of differential cutting, that pulverizing the inelastic plaque, and uh, while the elastic plaque of the uh, elastic vessel really deflects, so that basically the inelastic, the same mechanism of the uh, drill at the dentist uh, uh, setting. Now, clearly, the rotational atherectomy, the indications have been calcified lesion. In the past, we used to use rotational atherectomy for many other indications, which are listed on the left side here. But most important now, in the era of drug looting stent, rotational atherectomy is reserved for calcific lesions. And of course, sometimes when you have undilatable uh, chronic lesion, many of them are native vessel lesion where the graft has closed. And clearly, those lesions are very undilatable and uh, poses a lot of problems. So that basically the concept of the calcific and undilatable lesion. But there are a lot of issues and limitations. Two very important being slow flow and perforation. Of course, there is a whole series of uh, issues which could happen with any device, uh, particularly specific for the rotational atherectomy being a slow flow, no flow, and spasm, but uh, also the wire bias problem because of the burr tra traversing the vessel in the direction of the uh, least resistance and creating a gutter effect many times and of course the heat generation. But those are the issues, the two important one which really has deterred many physicians from doing rotational atherectomy are being the occurrence of slow flow and no flow and perforation. And I'll deal both of them particularly more so of the slow flow issue. Now, why? Well, the, it's the slow flow basically occurs because you generate the particle debris. The atheromatous debris embolism with interaction with the platelet and microthrombi really cause the distal plugging so that uh, we know that no matter how wide the pipe is, if you put too much sand, it will block that pipe. So with the same mechanism, if you create too much uh, debris, it's going to close the distal microvasculature. And of course, what has been shown by many experimental data, including of ours, that uh, this debris which is created by the rotation atherectomy also activates platelets. So that platelets not only are culprit, but they also get into uh, with the debris, uh, with the atheromatous debris and activation and cause the platelet plugging. And of course, various other issues do, pay, uh, do play some role. One of them, uh, the most important, I would say, amongst this list of these uh, factors besides creating the debris is the lower epicardial vessel pressure and higher LVDP. Now, what does that mean? Now, when we are working on the rotation of threat in a vessel, we know that we creating a stunning of that area of myocardium because the decrease in blood flow in that area, if patient already compromised, let's say we are working on the LED, RC is already closed or infarcted, that you are cre really creating a stunning of the myocardium. And that will lead to a decrease in the epicardial vessel pressure and will give rise to a higher LVEDP. So that now the gradient, uh, how the coronary blood flow occurs is the mean aortic pressure minus your and diastolic pressure, LV and diastolic pressure. So if a mean aortic pressure goes down, LV EDP goes up, which is a normal phenomena with rotational atherectomy, really cause the setup for the no flow and slow flow. And of course, uh, once it is no flow, it gives rise to a various uh, uh, consequences of decreased myocardial, uh, the flow, myocardial contractility, and so and so forth. Now, where does it occur? occurs in the long calcific lesions, in total occlusions, poor LV function, thrombotic lesions, so the rotation atherectomy is contraindicated. And there was some data that beta blocker, although subsequently we have published that beta blocker has not been an issue causing a slow flow. Now, how do you change this slow flow? And why I'm emphasizing on this slow flow issue is because this is the, we can have next slide, that uh, the slow flow is, is the one which really, you can lose a patient on the table. If patient really develop slow flow and no flow, and therefore in that setting that we need to uh, really avoid occurrence of the slow flow, and those are the various technical modification. That is using a small initial bar, then the gradual upsizing if you need, need to go to second bar, shorter ablation time, avoid drop in RPM, avoid hypotension and bradycardia. Very important issue which I wanted to say that the, as I mentioned, that mean, lower mean aortic pressure is one of the culprit starting with the slow flow so that you avoid occurrence of that lower 
aortic pressure. Simple rule that uh, the systolic blood pressure should be in three digits, over 100. If it is less than 100, then we give intravenous neosinephrine. Uh, bolus is, you know, it's, uh, neosinephrine is available in 10 milligram, 1 cc ampule. We dilute in 10. Discard 9, so that 1 milligram redilute in 10. So now you have a 0.1 uh, milligram or 100 microgram per cc. Give 1 to 3 cc intravenous, which increase blood pressure to about uh, 30 and 40. Sometimes cause reflex bradycardia, but good enough for you to do rotational threctomy for that time period. Uh, and therefore, do not do a rotational threctomy when blood pressure is in double digits. So that even if you happens, you are not able to complete the rotational threctomy, pull back the bar and give intravenous uh, neosinephrine. We have used dopamine in the past, but problem with the dopamine is it causes tachycardia and lasts longer, while neosinephrine effect lasts for two to three minutes. Then rotor flush, also to decrease the heat generation, is a routine along with the rotor glide solution, and we use the vasodilators of uh, nitroglycerin, heparin, and uh, verapamil, just 555, five, five, 5 milligram nitroglycerin, 5,000 of heparin, and 5 uh, uh, milligram of verapamil in one liter bag. And uh, the 2B3A, as I mentioned, with the platelet activation. And of course, once it occurs, use of the uh, adequate vasodilators, nitroproside, and sometimes even balloon pump. But most important treatment to prevent slow flow and no flow is to avoid it from happening by various technical details. Now, next slide. We actually have shown work that once you do rotation atherectomy, you do lyse platelets. The platelets will secrete various of their granules and the chemicals, which will activate the platelets. And therefore, the next slide. The earlier work uh, which uh, we did with Dr. Barry Kohler, one of our fellow, uh, Dr. Williams, who she is at, uh, uh, now uh, at John Hopkins, actually was the first one in an experimental model to show the effect of 2B3A as well as the slower speed. As you can see, that uh, the rotation atherectomy done with the slower speed and with the 2B3A, which is C7E3 fab, which is our Epsiximab, really blunts the platelet activation. Uh, and uh, this actually has been further uh, in, uh, corroborated by Mark Reisman, uh, again, the, having an experiment of uh, in the bone density uh, experiment and trying to see the aggregation of the, ro the platelet aggregation with the various speeds of rotational threctomy. And as you can see, the 140,000 RPM compared to traditional of 180,000, the 140,000 give rise to a less platelet aggregation. So that your smaller, the, you can say the slower rotation atherectomy uh, results in a significantly lower uh, numbers of the platelet aggregates. Next slide. The second issue in the technique came that should you do a continuous burring or intermittent burring? And this actually goes back to the similar experiment uh, uh, which uh, was shown earlier slide by Mark Reisman that con the, rather than continuous, if you have intermittent ablation at a slow speed, which is on the extreme right, cause the least platelet activation as well as lower temperature. So that you can make it a point, the technique which uh, Anu will talk about, that it's intermittent burring uh, is the way to go and uh, at a, a slow time period. Second issue, next slide, uh, that is that how aggressive you should be. And this actually has been looked into it, that should you use a very aggressive bar of 0 0.8, 0 0.9 or lower in conjunction with the balloon angioplasty. And this is the data uh, earlier before proceeded in uh, late 90s. And in the stratus trial, and we found that going with aggressive burr caused higher incidence of slow flow and higher CK release and also have a higher restenosis. So that goal should be avoid the deacceleration of more than 5,000 RPM and go to a medium uh, or routine uh, strategy, that is the burr to artery ratio of less than 0.8. And I'll come back a little later that we even have gone further from that concept. Next slide. The perforation, one of the big issues has been a perforation of the rotational threctomy. People are concerned about, and rightly so. Uh, one of the region perforation, rotational threctomy, give rise to the lesions which we use it for. These are the calcific angulated lesions. If you don't do a rotational threctomy, there is very tough for us to advance the devices, even a balloon sometimes, and so. So that these, many of these lesions are set up for rotational threctomy uh, or perforation, but rotational threctomy is implicated because that's what we use. But we, I can tell you, that many cases of the calcific, if we didn't use rotational threctomy, our personal experience has been at, in our lab that rotablation, uh, the balloon angioplasty, high pressure, cutting balloon, or sometimes even the stent cause more perforation than rotational threctomy. Therefore, you need to be very careful when we know that these are the lesions which are set up and those are the angulated lesions. Very simple. 
angulated lesions, your wire bias or total occlusion, those are the ones can give rise to a perforation. So that you need to have a strategy with a smaller initial burst size and uh, keep looking into uh, when doing a rotation arthrectomy before go further all the way through uh, by frequent injections that the perforation has not taken place. Very important point that in a complex rotation arthrectomy where we used to, we recommend using a 2B3A, if you exp suspect it's an angulated lesion and there could be rota the perforation that do not use 2B3A until rotablation is complete. Now, this puts down to the next slide, uh, which our Mount Sinai experience. Over the last few years, actually, 6 to 8 percent of the rot uh, PCI, around 450 per month, are being done with the rotation arthrectomy. And as you can see, the two important time period that what we learned initially with the short rota bar, rota flush, and apsiximab and stent that we really decrease the slow flow between the red bar and uh, the, uh, the major complication perforation. The real decrease in the perforation, in my opinion, occurred when we went down to the slow speed of 140 to 150,000 RPM. The clearly, that uh, slow flow was already kind of uh, handled, but the, by going to the slow speed, the rotation, the perforation really um, uh, decreased. And also now, that with a drug looting stent, the concept of having a bird to artery ratio of about 0.4 to 0.5. No need to go beyond 0.5, and in my opinion, that will translate to a, such a good results which we have at Sinai, having a less than 1% of the major complication. Now, another point for the rotation arthrectomy is it prevents uh, side branch occlusion uh, compared to if you put a stent across all those second generation stent like Zions, we are having a less of an impact of the side branch occlusion because they remain quite patent with the newer stents. But these are the data which we had with the J&J stent. Uh, one issue, uh, the two, that if you want to avoid putting a stent, rotation arthrectomy is the best device. This is actually the data from the DART trial, which is uh, comparing PTCA versus rotablation in the simple lesions and small vessels. And what we found, the dissection and bailout stent use was significantly lower by using rotation arthrectomy. So any situation when you need to avoid stenting, rotation arthrectomy will help you to reach there. So that therefore now if I c combine our device synergy, the DES by giving you be bigger lumen and uh, prevent recoil uh, rotation arthrectomy by pulverizing the calcific plaque, the rotor DES has a concept, uh, may potentially uh, cause better stent expansion, better MLD and lower restenosis. The only unfortunate part is that in a bare metal stent era, and these are the uh, trials of the angiographic and uh, in the red bar and uh, yellow bar being clinical, that there has been a no impact of uh, rotation arthrectomy in terms of the restenosis that continue to remain about 15%, 15 to 30, even the sport trial, and there was no difference in the rota uh, versus PTCA. So they clearly have a high restenosis. Uh, about 15, 20%. But can that change in the DES era? One of the important issues for the DES, as we know, is the stent expansion. And we know the rotation arthrectomy, based on uh, this uh, small study, uh, OSTI trial, that for lesion expansion in a calcific, high pressure alone, alone may not be enough, and you need rotation arthrectomy for your stent expansion, which is one of the important determinant of stent expansion, particularly with the DES, as well as lower stent thrombosis. There is a second concept. And concept basically is that for the DES to work, you need a uniform stent expansion. Because if your stents are, struts are crowded at one area, in a calcific and a non-calcific they expand, there will be a gap. And that gap will give rise to a focal instant restenosis. So that uniform stent expansion is key for, the, uh, for our drug looting stent, uh, uh, the long-term utility. And this actually has been shown in this next slide that if you have the intra strut angle, that your stent has been separated more than one millimeter, that actually translates on IVAS to a higher instant restenosis. So that there is, a, there is some theory behind that in a calcific lesion, that you have good uniform stent expansion so that the drug diffuses one millimeter and you don't have a gap and does not come back with a focal restenosis. There is say, well, the last slide being that what if I go with a high pressure? We learned that. The high pressure, if you damage the media, and if it's not a concentric calcium, we know that rarely it's a 360 degrees, it's like 270, your stent will go into the media and will give rise to, uh, and give rise to a more uh, inflammation and so. So that this concept is still remains uh, in the issue that the go high pressure may not be the answer in these particular cases. This is just the last slide of our experience, 
at uh, Sinai bare metal versus rota, what we have shown that using the rotational atherectomy in the calcific lesions increase their success. There was no difference in the BMS versus DES, but more importantly, that using a DES, you decrease uh, the overall uh, TVR from 15% to 5%. Uh, with that note, uh, while uh, other questions, if anybody asking, and uh, yes. we are going to re-engage uh, our catheter and uh, ready to uh, uh, start this uh, case with the rotational therapy. Samin, excellent uh, review. There are uh, several questions I have, several questions I have uh, gotten in the meantime, but we'll let you proceed so that we can uh, go on in a timely fashion. Uh, anu, I see you. Uh, in fact, I can, my first uh, Observation today is that our uh, transmission quality is much sharper, and I'm also told by the uh, by the staff here that we are moving very fast into a HD environment uh, from the next session. So that'll uh, make it even nicer. Uh, anu, what guide do you have there? This is an uh, FCL curve guide. Uh, if you see, it's a very short left main. So I, what we normally do is if it's a short left main, we would like to go with the CL curve. It's now what size is main. this a 7 this French? Is, yeah, 7 French. It's a bifurcation and uh, same thing. If we are likely to go with the two stents, then we would like to go with 7 French. Otherwise, uh, if the plan is, uh, despite bifurcation, we are going to do just a PTCA stent across. We do it with 6 French uh, alone. So we have a 7 French. We already showed you the angiogram with the moderate to heavy calcium uh, involving uh, both proximal to the lesion of the LAD, involving the diagonal. And uh, as Dr. Sharma mentioned, I think we are all set here with the rotational atherectomy. Now, if we can play the angiogram, if people can look at it. Anu, what's your anticoagulant and antiplatelet strategy here? So, knowing that he had his uh, previous uh, stent, He's uh, been already on aspirin and Plavix, uh, so we have given uh, him a loading dose of a 300 milligram of Plavix, gets his usual uh, 162 milligram of our aspirin, and uh, Angiomax has been given. He has an ACT that's running at about uh, 320. So the first foremost question which uh, we always face once you've decided in rotational atherectomy is what should be the birth size? I think based on uh, all the data that Dr. Sharma has shown that uh, since our Bar, uh, whatever we want to do, atherectomy is no other bar to artery ratio, not more than 0.5. I always tell the fellows, think what kind of stent that you're going to use and go half of that. So if you are thinking this LED is at least a 3O vessel at the level of the lesion, uh, then we go to 1.5 bar. And uh, if you see actually proximal to that, if you start seeing that it's bigger than that. So going to 0.5 to 0.6, we actually have taken about 1.75 uh, bar here. The question also comes, are we going to do the diagonal uh, rota because it's a calcified uh, even at that ostium. When there's osteal calcification, you will not get a good expansion either with the balloon, cutting balloon, uh, subsequently if you need a stent. So the, we have a 1.75 bar that has been uh, ready. So going just to the basics, how to get rotational atherectomy ready. When the tech opens the bar, as you see, the entire bar, it's already connected and it comes out with the uh, console. And this is the bar that is here. It comes with two connection. This is for the nitrogen tank connection. This is the fiber optic connection which goes and it's given to the uh, tech. And what they're going to do is connect it, if you can just show it at the console showed the console there, just show where the, the, the nitrogen tank is connected uh, to one and it's very important that we got to make sure the connection is done the right way. We see it very nicely now. Yeah. Okay. And uh, we see a green button which is the Dynaglide. So on your pedal there are two things, one uh, your foot plate, okay, one is your pedal which is for the rota, other one is a small button on the side which is for the Dynaglide and always make sure that the Dyna is on, which means you see the green light. Once you've done your connection and you know the things are okay, you've got to do a test. And here the connection, you're done. And the other one is for the flush. I know it was my feeling that you're not using the Dyna Glide that often these days. Uh, Dyna is very important uh, in uh, two things. One, when you're coming out, you definitely need it. Going in, you don't need it because it's easy to go forward. Exactly. Coming out, when uh, uh, it's a lot of friction, 
will happen it's easier if it's rotating and coming out exactly like the screw driver you know when you rotate and you go forward easily instead of rather pushing it forward so now this is the connection for the flash there is a three way stop cock uh, dr mahesh sharma already mentioned we have it connected to the bag a liter with a heparin uh, verapamil and uh, nitroglycerin and then you just open it and once you open the three way stop cock you start seeing the flush that's coming out of the bar and always very important like we say the key thing that is you got to see it dripping so when the bar is not moving you see the drip about 7 to 8 drops per minute when it starts rotating it uh, drips faster when you know it's dripping then you know that's the only time if you can go forward for some reason at some place the connections are not correct and you don't see the dripping you should not go for, forward with the rota in in the body because there will be a lot of heat generation the inside the body and can can be uh, catastrophic so very important you make sure that your um, you know the flush is dripping and most of the challenges uh, uh, operators continue to have is really with the rota wire what yeah. are some so of the i'm going the... to go to that now So now is above you know the knob make sure the knob is moving you not to lose and just keep it at the side because this is a 90 cm keep it at the end so that you will have your entire bar length when you are in the body then open the rota wire if you see that's how it comes and uh, this is the rota clip that's connected very important is first thing and the foremost once that you have dipped in the water which we do that take it out and take this wire out from stopper. the stopper here at the end once you done that your blue thing comes off and this is where your rotor tip is now it's very easy to pull the rotor wire out and also same thing the rotor wire has a lot that is it's coated with lot of stuff just clean it couple of times and big loops i always tell the fellows don't mix spaghetti very difficult to take it out big loops like this and just keep it in the side and you can make the curve at the tip we already have another rotor wire that's there now the next question comes here is how are we going to wire the led are we going to go with the rotor wire because it's not uh, very torches in the proximal area i think we decided we'll just go with the rotor wire direct and clip uh, the 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 curve of the wire should be the same way what you do it for a regular wire and the important point is if you are complex like in this case the diagonal comes at an angulation if we need to go with the diagonal i would suggest you over the wire with your work horse wire and then change over the wire balloon or over the wire export catheter change it to the uh, go into the side branch advance the export catheter or balloon and then change it to a rotor wire it's a stainless steel wire it's not a user friendly and kinks very fast and you got to be very careful it doesn't kink because if it kinks the bar is not going to go forward same it is star 1014 becomes 009 and 007 at the tip we are in the and this is the challenge will be in this particular case because very short left main and even fcl4 guide is pointing into the um, circumflex circumflex yeah. yeah and we actually used uh, the vl uh, for the surf and that's why i try to avoid using a vl in this case and uh, and you know once you take it out the guide comes out so that if there's a issue i would say that don't waste time and quickly go if uh, uh, that uh, with a 1.5 uh, balloon and exchange it with the with the wire although good, good. use the clip well, there you go yeah. you're across the into a small septal and see this is where i think uh, uh, most of the the people find the challenge that the feel of this wire is uh, is somewhat different than uh, totally different yeah it's the the movement everything is totally different doesn't move like the other uh, we we friendly wires that we have and same you have to make sure the tip is in the main vessel doesn't sit in any small vessel our cameraman uh, is is doing a wonderful job with uh, getting uh, focused on your hands today this is one of the specific requests we had received uh, samin what are you planning to do here at the moment put a second uh, wire down the diagonal right now uh, no which will be if uh, i think the the first uh, because of this uh, bifurcation and knowing the calcific in the led uh, we uh, 
do the rotation hysterectomy of the LED, then evaluate, and I would be inclined, unless we see some dissection, do a 1.5 bar. This is the selected right. of 1.75, and do a 1.5 bar for the diagonal. Excellent. So, yeah. So now we have ready that upside down so that the flush is coming out. Uh, just show the... the yeah. That. Very important also wiring this uh, burr. You have to be at the center of the burr. If you see its conical shape, the proximal uh, half is the one where you have the diamond chips. So, I mean, that was an important uh, point uh, uh, by uh, Dr. Mehta is if you have bifurcation, uh, whatever do we do with the wire? I mean, it's uh, we cannot leave the wire in the side branch when you are doing rotational atherectomy because the burr will cut the wire. So, even if you have to do uh, the wiring, it will be after we have burnt the main vessel. Okay. And uh, once the is come out, you leave it here, gap before the Y connector. Then, important thing, the move it here. The clip has to be connected to the back tip end. of the wire, back end of the wire, once it's come out of the console. And what does this uh, little clip do? Though it's little, it prevents the wire from a moving when the, the burr is rotating on the wire inside the vessel. If the clip is not connected, very important, you can't even do the test or you cannot rotate because the wire is now spinning inside the coronary artery. Now you see it's dripping, the water is yeah. the dripping and so we're just going to do the speed check. And hold it this way. 155, that's good. Very important, you hold it, your Y connector and your burr like this. If you leave it and you check, it will pick the cotton fiber or any fiber that's around the burr. It's not good. So, Samin, the strategy we are going to have is you're going to have a low burr intermittent uh, burr. Ablation. Yes. So, basically, same, uh, the low speed actually uh, in 2003, we switched uh, to our low burr speed. Anu, I have a question here. They want you to specifically show how you remove the slack. Okay. No problem. So now we are going in. So going in, if you have two luxury of two people in your lab, good. If you are the only person and you have a nurse or a tech working with you, you can still do it. Now is this uh, what you find often, the, the wire slipping? Uh... Yeah, no, no. What happened is I was talking and didn't go in and I think Dr. Sharma was doing. So yeah. what happens if it's one person, one goes in. So yes. most of the time uh, during a routine uh, PCI, we we'll, we often like to have the wire uh, doubled up uh, distally. Is, uh, distally, yeah. No problem with that here? No. Excellent. So that's a 175 bar now? 175 bar. Now you see that it's coming off the left main. And also important thing, uh, what most uh, operator feel is that when it's coming out of the guide into the vessel, be it the RCA or in the left main, it can create angle and have some problem. Try to go in. If it doesn't, it's creating a lot of problem. Then stop here. And the three important steps to take the slack off to prevent the uh, burr from jumping. The first foremost is you already have the knob. You release it. Move it backward forward here. Excellent. By doing that, you're going to take the slack away from the Teflon sheet and the burr. And the next thing is you go on fluoro and you open your Y connector. Move it backward forward. You see a little movement of the burr in the left main. By doing that, the, the any kind of uh, tension that is there between the wire and the burr is gone. And the last step would be you, are, you should be on the dynaglide and then you just do a tap. You see that the burr never moved. No jump. So now what you can do is on the dyna, that far. Okay. Hmm? Too far. Okay. Pull back. Wire is wire has gone into the septal, so yes. that is So he's trying to move the wire. There you go. Yeah. 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 And that movement has to be on the dyna. Yeah. Now at this moment, okay, you reseated the guide. That's exactly yeah. what I was going to ask you. So we are ready to burn now. Same thing, the important one will be slow pecking motion, like a woodpecker. You go forward, come back. You have a lesion, so you go forward, come back. Every movement you are going a little bit forward. 
and not more than 20 seconds. I think no single word describes it better than polishing. So we were able to burn the entire length. They are saying it's 16 seconds. I am just going to do the polish now. And once sometimes when you think that uh, you selected a bar, you brought the bar to the vessel and you think maybe it's too big. Simple principle is that you take an injection and if you see there is no distal flow, you are not in the legion, but you don't see any distal flow means your bar is too big. You go down to the bar and here you see that there is a nice distal flow and never leave the bar in the legion. Just pull back. Go. And One second. Yeah. Now the same thing, we don't have the guide that's engaged, you don't have to. As long as you're nicely aligned, you're okay. So, I mean, how do you objectively decide that you've had enough burring? Yeah, I think once you know that you have gone through the lesion and there's no any resistance, that's the time you know you crossed it. And very important is at that point, when you're the exit point, of the leash and you have to be careful also that the burr may jump. That will be very slow and once you know the leash and you have done it, then you do the complete polishing and come out. And here, when the burr is coming out, I am pressing the brake. This is the brake release and advancing the wire. Just like any over the wire system, you will take out from, as soon as it comes out, take the clip, close the flush, remove the burr uh, over the wire and then you decide what you need to do for the main vessel or the side branch. And looks like the patient, uh, uh, you know, his EDP was quite high. We gave him a little nitro and uh, Lasix. He's having, a, we put a condom catheter, but he's still having a little problem in peeing. Tell him that, you know, it'll be all right. A few more minutes. Now, clearly that you need to see now that what it is. Okay. Also, now you know this is a 300 wire. It's going to make big loops. Just... Not too many, and just leave it at the side. Oh, so no, as you were as you were advancing the burr, uh, mm. there did not appear to be too much of a wire bias. But did you do some maneuvers to to completely eliminate that? Actually, in this case, there was no wire bias. Right. Yeah, I think uh, you see it straight. Uh, no, when you normally see it is if you have the lesion that's angulated. So what's what's your inference looking at this angiogram? If we can show that again, uh, what what are you, Samin, deciding now? Yeah. Well, I think uh, because uh, you saw it in uh, uh, in a dense calcium at the ostium of the diagonal, and I think what we should do is that put uh, uh, our rotor wire into the diagonal and uh, do the burr. And I think this we can use the same 1.75 burr for that purpose. Would you would you have ever considered if you had a doubt about putting an IVUS there to to examine well, that's that? That's another way. Yes, absolutely. Uh, but that uh, but angiographically we knew about uh, this part. Will die. Uh, so this is the second rotor wire. Yeah, no. this actually right now I think that the diagonal will be a little difficult. Yes, to go with the rotor wire. Right. So the very simple that I can do it, but I want to teach here that what usually I would recommend to do, and that is use your the regular wire, which uh, this is the fielder, and the which we are used. And, and the support uh, catheter the, to change exactly, it Exactly. And this is the 1.5, uh, actually 6 millimeter um, uh, sprinter? The balloon, sprinter balloon. Uh, we are taken. Yeah, throw this away. And uh, we are just we'll change it to the rotor wire now. So that will be the, in these kind of complex angulated cases, rotor wire is not your friend. So that it will not go through it. Rather than you will destroy the tip, give the dye, may even cause dissection, so that you need to go with, uh, in an angulated vessel, while LED was no problem, but in uh, this angulated uh, diagonal, that you want to go only uh, with the, your work through, work horse wire, uh, with the balloon or uh, transit catheter and change it to the rotor wire. And you're going to keep the second wire in the LED as which you work through out, the diagonal? Which, which we have taken out. You've taken now, out. Now, rare yeah. case... If you need to leave it for some reason that because there is a dissection, if you are not doing the rotablation of the proc that portion of the LED, then it's okay. But if you are planning to do rotor right from the distal, the lesion, uh, proximal end of the lesion and so, then you have to take the wire out from the LED. So, so in this particular case, we are going to start from the ostium. Uh, therefore, we have to take the wire out from the 
LED. See specifically what you are going through at the moment. This is what operator find it hard how this wire handles. If yeah. you had some other wire, that would be so easy to get it down the diagonal there. Yeah. So what you now do is take the clip and try to rotate it again. Here. Yep. The only way the tip of the rotor wire will listen will to die. you is uh, use this clip. Sometimes have you had to change the clip and use a regular uh, torquing device and put back the clip later? No, you could actually, we have tried a couple of times, the torquing device, uh, it does listen to that too. Right, exactly. See, this is this is where, where specifically a lot of uh, operators, including myself, we get frustrated how the tip of the wire handles. Yeah, See, uh, this one could give you a wire bias mm -hmm. if you look at it. Right, absolutely. The diag and then you have a dip and uh, angle in that. So what position. would be your strategy would be then to downsize there you have your uh, very nicely proceeded with that uh, tortuosity in the diagonal. Yeah, now the thing question, do we have to go that distal or do we just take care of the ostium? Yeah. Hmm? Yeah. No, I think this case, uh, I felt that just to take care of the ostium will be good enough uh, because the mild lesion at the bifurcation uh, and uh, just uh, the uh, everything is at the ostium. All the wire is very nice. Whatever we want to do will be okay. Well, I can tell you that the majority of the operators, this is where I think uh, your uh, your greater expertise is coming in handy. Majority of the people would probably burr down the LED and uh, just either balloon the diagonal or... Uh, uh, but uh, this is this is an excellent uh, demonstration. So you are planning to put in a 1.5 burr now? Well, actually, um, uh, let's uh, take a I picture. So we already have this 1.75 bar attached. And the uh, question is, do we go uh, downgrade the bar or we just go with the same? Now, this well, is the size. Going now, with your principle of 0 0.5, uh, it makes sense to downsize, no? But uh, it yeah. looks about what, 2.5, 2.75? 2.75? Yeah. yeah. It's about, yeah. The, I think we have a 1.5 bar. This will be a demonstration also. Although I don't want to teach people... Attaching the different, you know, bars, that itself is a very tough task. Right. Let everybody just uh, learn from the rotation atherectomy steps. The Your bar attachment comes already with the rotor link, so that you do not need to worry about. Rare cases, and I said that your 95, 98% should be a single bar approach. But if anybody wants to see uh, connections, it's very simple. This comes with a notch and a sheath. So you put the notch on top of uh, uh, there and advance the sheath. Now, once you advance the sheath, you should try to detach the bar, put a pressure. Ah, it means now you are connected. The, it basically, the notch, it's a, you know, you have to do a kind of simulation uh, because don't try, otherwise uh, uh, it may take a lot of time and not uncommonly that it just uh, sits together and not a nice notch fit so that the bar detaches. So the very important that after you advance the sheath of that uh, notch that you try to separate two segments and uh, that if have been uh, attached in the right groove, that it will not uh, it will not separate. Samin, I'm going to take yeah. uh, care of several questions which yeah. have uh, come through at this time. Uh, almost all of them are are talking about the mm -hmm. same theme. Secondly, and let me see if I can try to, to yeah. summarize their uh, their concerns and sentiments together. The same steps or yeah. no? No, no. Yeah. Anu, I'll let you, let you first demonstrate what you have to and then we'll tackle it. No, the it's the question. same. You continue. Excellent. We are Excellent. repeating the same process with the 1.5 bar. Do exactly yeah. the same, same thing each time. Yeah. Each time. That's it. So now we have the wire very nicely doubled up in the diagonal. Samin, the questions are why is there such a disparity in this, uh, in what you are doing, that uh, here you have a highly experienced uh, person using the rotational uh, ablation. And I have seen uh, some of the most amazing cases uh, that you've done: uh, uh, distal left mains, bifurcating, trifurcating lesions. Uh, the concern is why? Why is this technology not? Uh, as uh, prevalent and as common as it should be, why is it uh, that uh, the growth for this device has been stagnant uh, uh, almost uh, uh, so less in Europe, uh, in Asia, and uh, your use is uh, much higher than what people are tending to do? Does it have to Not do just really. with your expertise? No. Yeah. Well, I think that's a very important point. And I can tell you that it's a little disappointment from the uh, even the Boston scientific point of view that since they uh, bought the technology from heart, uh, that there has been a no investment done 
in any research development except that they made a rota link uh, plus that there are two important issues one the technique issue yes it's a steep learning curve it's a little difficult yeah this is a very important teaching point here i think both led and diagonal i was able to burr very easily but here i'm hitting resistance and uh, the question that was raised earlier by dr mehta is there a wire bias there is a wire bias here when there is a wire bias and you know there is resistance you have to be very careful means you got to burr maybe few times and what you have to do is while you are burring also pay attention to the noise when the rpm drops more than 5000 you can hear a different kind of a noise that it's making see that bend there you are not planning go, to go through uh, the go second lesion right you you stop short of that second lesion yeah yeah excellent I think oh, that's I that's another important point is not to get uh, carried away. The intent there was to to burst through the bifurcation. Same. I'm going very slow. I know how how did it feel? Uh, you know the motion going through the LED versus the diagonal. Yeah, right? diagonal LED was okay, but here I'm definitely having a lot of resistance. but at this point you are fairly across the yeah yeah but go. we have decided to do the second lesion okay you have yeah because it's a, the, i think there's a lot of calcium okay. there and it's and a big diagonal yep so you're not uh, concerned about that little tortuosity there we just try yeah, to go yeah, a little yeah. slow kind of okay. yeah. we're going very slow excellent all right there you go advance the wire and many time when wire comes back you can advance the wire with the dam with the pressing on the brake release What's the speed at this moment? Good. You see yes. that now? How it made the turn? Yeah, all is now. Yes, we did. But I, I can tell you, not too many people would uh, would have the courage to go through that second lesion. Yeah. Yeah. Now the coming back to the point that why rota has not become that favorite uh, is part of that is the same complications, the learning curve, and second is this issue with this wire. I can tell you one of the biggest enemy of the rotation attract me technique point of view is this wire. I'll I'll help you along that way. I just have a question. In fact, a statement sent in by somebody who has called it this rota wire is a pain. Yeah, pain. That's it. To put it, I can if they make it a point zero one four rota bar. Actually, you know, accommodating the rota volume, which is in the country actually just like two point eight percent. uh it will double or triple at sinai we are about 6 to 7% but the rota use will double or triple is just because of the wire issue and uh, the, you know many other arthrectomy devices are in uh, planning but none of them are coming uh, that uh, optimistic that uh, will come or replace uh, whether the csi uh, elliptical uh, orbital uh, arthrectomy or uh, no, the wire wire run through wire somewhere yeah yeah put both wires yeah yeah so now you can see in this particular case actually now we have had a it's okay or no section start this is the wire bias yeah. into the side branch yes yeah so put into the side branch first no there is a rota yeah huh? need a fielder then this yeah. is a run through yep yeah. yeah get a fielder wire Give me a 2.5, uh, 20. Uh, the Maverick two. also. Maverick two. Yeah. Yeah. You know, uh, the guide is too far in. So what wire is yeah. this one? That's now? a run-through wire. Okay. And now we're same going through with the, the same fielder wire into the side branch. Short left main. Every time you need to wire, the guide has to be out. Remove the rotor. Now we are going to go with the fielder wire to the dag. This is two or two point five. Mm-hmm. Okay. See, this is. I think you are exactly right. Uh, this. This. Uh, motion of uh, you know changing wires and uh, uh, you know i think that is probably one of the things uh, which which uh, i think should be sorted out and make it more compatible with the 
technology what uh, one is doing with standard PCI I think that would uh, clearly take uh, a step further Yeah. Let's uh, take care of the diag first. Take the other wire. Yeah, the diag actually same. Uh, the second lesion uh, has created a little wire bias. Yes, it has. Yeah. So we are going to take care of that now. So going to put a balloon there. Yeah, yeah just yes. the balloon. Take that uh, rota mm -hmm. wire out now. What if we are in the yeah, section? No? Take the rota wire out and you go with the low pressure. Should be okay. Go. Okay, good. So just low pressure, uh, right from that mid area. Yeah, there is some ST changes right now in the lateral lead, and I am sure it's related to the diagonal. So we need to be just a little more careful and do a little longer uh, ACT, check our ACT. Uh, the blood pressure hemodynamically good. Uh, how is the patient doing? Having a chest pain? He's okay? Good. But he, did he make a urine yet? He still cannot make the urine, huh? 2528 Zions for the dial. Okay. Has to make it. Yeah. 2528 Zions first. Yeah. Now, any other question about. Uh, yes, the I have been answering several questions all related to the technique. All of them have been very nicely covered uh, with uh, by Anu and by you. That has not been any, any major. Uh, uh, most of the remarks have been people have uh, been asking about the case selection. A specific question which was asked was that uh, in the presence of heavy calcification, would there be still any situation where you would not use a rotablator? My thought was that it had to do with the angulation. Yes. Good. Yep. And uh, beyond that, uh, uh, the overriding uh, theme which people have had is that uh, they wish they could use this technology as well as you. Well, I think it's a it's a good uh, device to use, and uh, particularly uh, the, we need to open the LED first before we put a stent in the diagonal. Uh, that uh, just go through the steps and this some of the huh? Stent the diagonal first. Yeah. This one. Yeah. It okay. Or do we go see Okay, now we have dilated the diagonal and let's take a picture that has created actually a wire bias slash dissection. So we are going to put a stent into the diagonal first. So this, this happens, you know, that despite uh, very, uh, uh, you can say that maybe we should not have gone to the second lesion and just kept at the ostium, but you saw that even wiring the second lesion even the my 1.5 balloon did not go to the second lesion, could not cross it. So it was a tough lesion in the at that bifurcation. So that uh, the choice of going with the rotablation was correct. Uh, we needed it, and actually that gave more resistance than anything. So that uh, now we are dilated with the balloon, and we are going to put a stent in the uh, second area. Now the, the hindsight could be that maybe if we would have just done the ostium, leave the second, but clearly that patient may have been asymptomatic with it. So that uh, this always is a very tough uh, decision. I, also, I, EKG has improved now. There is a reasonable flow. There is still a dissection into the uh, branch, uh, into the diagonal, but uh, there is a good flow now so that uh, hopefully this stent will take care of it. Yeah. 
This is exactly the yeah. teaching value of this kind of a case. Uh, Samin, you are planning to use what, a 2.5 stent? Is it's that? Like 2.528 Zions. Zions, two, excellent. So, you are going to cover that science. entire yeah. distal segment. Yeah. And this is the beauty of the second generation stents. That will go through this yeah. all angulated and How, so. Samin, uh, uh, another question which has come in. What's your uh, use uh, of the respective drug eluting okay. stents yeah. at the moment at your institution? Yeah, we actually, uh, about uh, the overall DS use is around 84% uh, in our lab and 16% uh, are uh, non DS and those are patients going for surgery or acute MI setting on rare cases of vein graft. Uh, but otherwise, uh, unless there is an issue about patient not taking the uh, Plavix, that all getting a drug looting stent. And uh, majority of them uh, actually now is the Zion SV. Uh, we do use some uh, cases with the Cypher, uh, particularly in the osteal lesion and uh, some bifurcations. Uh, and uh, Endeavor, particularly the rare, uh, the cases which you have to go for surgery in three to six months. And we know that we have to stop the Plavix. And therefore, a uh, few percentage of cases use the endeavor for that purpose. Now, Anu, how high did you go on the... Eight. Eight, eight. atmosphere. Okay. And uh, eight. I'm sure this is what you find all the time, that once you've done a satisfactory rotablation, the balloon is inflated and fully uh, dilated at much lower atmospheres. Yeah. And otherwise, also in a small vessel, sometimes when you're using a 2.5 DES, you can just go with the... Um, at a low pressure uh, for a 2.25 vessel, although this is a 2.75, uh, so that uh, if need to post dilate, you can always bring a bigger balloon, but low pressure with a Zion so that does not create the stent expansion at the corners and balloon overhang and dissections uh, was the problem when we were using uh, this. Uh, and of course, now the data are very good uh, based on the recent our spirit and compare that uh, the uh, the, the Zions has actually outperformed uh, other stand, particularly the Texas, our first generation, uh, in uh, recent trials. So, how often are you uh, are you routinely uh, going with the non-compliant balloon subsequently, or uh, do you? No, we I would say that about 65 percent of the time, 65 percent of the time we are going with the non-compliant balloon, uh, and others that if looks good expansion and geographically, and we actually many of our cath lab areas have the stand boost. If we see a full expansion there, uh, then we are not, uh, uh, we are just going with the, uh, the low pressure inflation and no need for post dilatation as long as we are confirmed or we are sure that the stent has fully expanded. Good. Good. So this is good. Now we need to take care of the. Yeah, which is fine. Yeah. So now, question comes is the how do you take care of the LED? Uh, that we let's dilate the LED first. This is a little more than what I bargained for, for the diagonal. We thought that we'll just come up with the one stent. This was a large vessel. We knew uh, actually the EKG has improved significantly. Let's dilate the LED first, quickly, because we are reaching the time also. We are like three or four minutes. Which here? Yeah. Now with the two point uh, NC Voyager, uh, we are what going to dilate to the LED. LED. Yeah. What do you want to do there? And I think we need to put two stents now, one into the diagonal coming at the, in a V or a small SKS fashion. Uh, right there uh, to uh, cover this area completely. So that we need two stands. No. Samin, I have a question from, I think uh, this may be uh, hard to make out. I think it's out of the country uh, uh, asking both you and Anu, please comment on the use of newer generation stents, Zions and Promus for osteal lesions. Yeah. Do they have less radial strength than Taxus or Cypher? Yeah, no, that is true. But only question remains is that what we have seen, that particularly the osteal left main, we have been an issue. But others, by using an adjunct atherotomy balloon, like a cutting balloon and so on, in some cases, uh, our uh, NGO sculpt, that what we have seen basically is that you don't need to uh, worry about. But osteal left main, I've been disappointed. Uh, many of the cases that Zions just did not open it well uh, and had to put a cipher inside there. Uh, but otherwise, other osteal lesions, we will uh, we have used without uh, any issues uh, the second generation of our Zions and Promus. Two other quick questions. Uh, did you pace this patient? Uh, well, actually, not necessary. No, too far. Yeah, yeah. That uh, this particular case, uh, we'll use it only the pacing. Uh, pull back a little bit. Uh, the pacing will use only in the cases uh, where uh, uh, the right coronary artery and so. 
and therefore this particular case i would not start as such but if the yes patients start becoming bradycardic or uh, uh, slow with the asystole many time with the rotablation as soon as you start in that particular case i would use a pacemaker but not routinely we don't use it for a uh, led uh, right definitely you need it when you are doing a rotational atherectomy or dominant circ and elderly people if you are doing a uh, you know left main either osteal or distal left main if you have to do rot and they were totally occluded uh, rca in that uh, con- uh, you know in that situation is a plus minus you may have to use it question But, uh, definitely not for the led question from down under uh, do you use rotational ablation for instant restenosis the very rare case if uh, i put a st- our wire went in and uh, actually matter of fact i just did last week the patient was referred to us because instant restenosis they advanced the wire and they could not go with any balloon yeah let this yeah. one out and in that particular case i used the rotablation now we did have our own trial you know the original trial the artist and show uh, that no benefit of rotational atherectomy for instant restenosis when we did our trial uh, the the roster trial did show some borderline benefit but overall by and large you can make it that there is no clear need for using a rotational atherectomy for instant restenosis except in the cases where if the restenosis in the side branch and you cannot get any device so they stand jail second that you cannot advance any of your device even tornus uh, and uh, you see the large plaque burden the very distal runoff is very small and you try to do a balloon dilatation and you will have a so much debris and it will not go downstream and you will never have a good flow in those rare c- situations uh, we'll use a rotational atherectomy uh, with the uh, the in a case of instant restenosis Okay. I mean, looking so, good there. Uh, you want to diagram? Yeah, let's do. I'm uh, 2.5 and 2.75, 23 and 20 or 18, right? Or times two. Uh, I think we put a two, 2.5, 23 should be good. LED also? Yeah. 28. Okay, LED 2.75, 28, and diagonal 2.5, 23. Which one here? I'm Which surprised. I thought yeah. you would be using a 3.0 for the LED. Well, the point is that uh, approximately uh, the will overlap few millimeter, but you are right. Uh, but the th- same thing in this case, you go into the diagonal first. Give us a diagonal one. So, are you planning a simultaneous casting? Yeah, stenting which actually, here? I mean, this truly the lesion is, uh, you know, by my definition, the V stenting versus SKS that proximal carina is less than five millimeter, like three or four. Uh, that in that particular case, uh, uh, you know, I'm sorry, less than three millimeter. That it's kind of a V. so that in this particular case i would call it a v stenting because there was a very short carina proximally or lesion so that yes the goal will be to little overlap proximally to uh, both these stents samin we are going a little beyond time i am going to keep quiet at the moment and let you quickly finish the case now i mean if you look at the size of the dag actually it's almost reaching uh, size you know, of the apex, led yes. led yeah yes that's so why he had more symptoms with the uh, uh, diag than the led and more diffusely disease mm-hmm. so we are going with the 2523 to the side branch diagonal first and then we go to the led yep. and uh, you are going to once again demonstrate the three or the four steps to do the sks yes excellent short sks okay give the other stent this is in the led the run through yep go well i know that we started about 5 minutes late but we should be done now in next 2 minutes what happens when the satellite goes away hmm? i no. can only hope that uh, the viewers found it very instructive how to set up and use the the rotablator and the various steps oh, particularly the handling the wire yep absolutely and i would just say that you know you always uh, Uh, try to um, come back and uh, make it a points that uh, what are the you know learn every case we keep learning uh, we have a set protocol in this particular case that if i had to do this case again probably uh, yeah let go both of them at the overlap and then you pull back both simultaneously you see the two dots together yes yeah. we see okay. it very nicely and then i'm just pulling I'm back wondering why both. do you even need the hd this is good enough oh we yeah <laughs> both This is an excellent job by your camera crew. See it very nicely. So you are going to get uh, the the markers exactly overlapped. Yeah, yeah. 
Okay, now they are nice and overlapped. So now, which yeah. which of the stent are you going to expand first, and at both how many? Both go same time. time at so how many atmospheres now? So since this is both are zions, we will go both at eight. Uh, eight. Both. Excellent. Okay. So you know, this is step number one. Their deployment pressure is uh, nine. Yeah. That's their. Okay. The so LED is nice so to expand it. So both stents well expanded at eight. Yeah. yeah. And now I'm going to go with the diag to twelve. Okay, I thought you would go higher than that, but no. But no, I think so that will be good okay. expansion. Good expansion. Excellent. Yes. The, All this right. Is a, yeah, we don't go. You are right. If it has a first cipher, generation cipher, cipher, I'll go with the 18 plus. Excellent. And okay. same thing with the now. I'm going to go with the LED, which also is the third. Also at 12. Step. That this one, what I require 12, 14 will be my limit. Excellent. But here actually 12, good expansion. And at the like at the same time, yeah. both the stents are exactly like overlapped with yeah. their markers. Eight again, and last one eight again. Okay. Good. Okay. Simultaneous both are eight negative. simultaneous, nice expansion okay. and down. Now, same thing. When you are trying to come out, you have to be careful. We'll take it one by one. Both the wires. Yeah. See the. the you have to do some. Jiggling movement so that no, they come overlap. out. Okay. Area. What happened in the overlap area of the diagonal? Mm -hmm. I'm just dilating a little more. Okay. At the same 14. They will take the LED out. You can take the LED out. And no problem whatsoever about any of the wires getting jailed and all the concern people used to have. No. Yeah. The key is that as long as you keep the wires on each side, one. Secondly that use the most difficult wiring first because what happens is that in the in this particular case you need to go to the diagonal first before the LED otherwise the wire spins so that you want to go to the most difficult uh, uh, the difficult wiring first and then the main wiring see when I'm trying to take out the balloon from the diag the wire keeps going to a small Vessel, so to be careful. Yet it was important to see that with the, both the stents, there was no sucking of the guiding catheter as you, you find yeah. with the other stents. Yeah. Take this out then. So both wires are out. You're going yeah, to give yeah, some nitro. Yeah, we nitro purposely, uh, yeah, we gave some dye. Looks, everything looks okay. Now we call this what is a rehabilitation of the vessel with the nitro, varapamil, good flush, you know, hand flush. So. Whatever little spasm that we have created in the distal portion of that diag, you know, after the stent, well, we have created spasm there. So everything opens up. Samin, a question from uh, Dr. Ashokan from India. What is the role of angiosculpt or cutting balloon in this particular case? Yeah, in this particular case, I would say that could have been done if you wanted to do a uh, osteal diagonal with the uh, cutting balloon or uh, with angiosculpt. So, which is reasonable, although so once you see a heavy calcium, I'm a little concerned about, and uh, uh, let's see if this is the case. Looks beautiful Everything there. is coming back here, and this is what we say, that it's about the time and we are done with that. Yep. <laughs> Samin, but yep. for the feeble-hearted or somebody who is uh, not such an expert with the rotational ablation, a strategy in this particular case of rotablating the LED and using a cutting balloon for the diagonal will be acceptable? Absolutely, yes. Now, in about 5% of these cases, you may not be able to get a cutting balloon in the side branch. Now, what we see in the past, we're using angioscalp for that purpose, but we found that angioscalp didn't help much. Uh, therefore, in... You're not going with a rota, then you put two wires, one wire already and second wire, and then use your high-pressure balloon. If your cutting balloon does not make a turn or angiosculpt, and then put a stent across, and then uh, you can jail the wire need to be, except what I, we have learned now that do not jail the run-through wire, which is an issue, and I know one case actually required even uh, um, uh, surgery to uh, remove. That run-through is a great wire. You saw it, how complex, angulated run-through wire goes very well. But for the side branch, run-through wire is not a right wire. They do not, I mean, the jailing, sorry, not side branch, for jail point of view, jailing the run-through wire should not be jailed. While we have good experience with the BMW and hydrophilic wire plus minus, but uh, run-through wire should not be jailed. With that note, I think uh, we have done an excellent uh, uh, the demonstration of some of the limitations of the device. We felt that we need to go to that second legion. Uh, and uh, because of that uh, very difficulty, but turns out to be we paid the price by creating the wire bias and the dissection. But 
our wire remained distal. We rewired side by side, did a balloon dilatation, and this kind of, uh, you know, uh, all the last slide, I don't think we need to go through it, but the take-home message would be that in some complex cases, we're heavily calcified, rotational atherectomy really broaden our horizons uh, in terms of interventional point of view that we can do safely and expect to have a good long-term results and possibly ro lower re uh, Otherwise, uh, uh, if you would have done the intervention without using the rotational atherectomy. Samin, congratulations to you and your team. Anu, excellent job as always. Uh, I am hopeful that this has been very instructive uh, to the audience. Uh, we have... Uh, specifically addressed uh, your uh, your issues today that they wanted to see more techniques uh, more uh, finer uh, movements with the wire i hope they have been captured uh, uh, this concludes our fourth case uh, the fifth session will be november uh, 17th uh, 8 o'clock uh, uh, once again i'll uh, individually try my best to get back to your emails and uh, thank you all for watching we'll see you next time thank you there definitely is a problem.